in your holy name. Amen. And good morning, church. Well, the, the skit kind of covered a bunch of the things that I'm going to speak about today. So that was a, I was going to say that might be the sermon, or maybe that is just the intro uh, for today. So I'm going to ask you guys uh, a few questions to get us uh, cracking for today. Are you a task-focused person or a people-focused person? So hands up if you're a task-focused person. Yep, Okay. Hands up if you're a people-focused person. Hands up if you're both. Okay. I'm not sure if that kind of felt a little bit like kindy or preschool or something like that. Hands going up for all sorts of things. Uh, anyway, I've made lots of judgments. I'm thinking about future planning and serving and all that sort of stuff. So, so that's really helpful as I, as I kick off uh, what the Lord is going to share uh, through me today. But it is a really interesting question. And can you be both? A lot of people put their hands up, um, and I certainly don't disagree uh, with that. Just a really quick insight, and you're not going to be able to see that too well. Um, but you know, there's lots of different personality profiles and you know, uh, things you can kind of do around that space. Are you task? Are you people? And this is one that I did a little while ago. And I'm um, so there's, I look pretty similar, uh, but the bottom sort of quadrant is more people, and the top is. Uh, or half, sorry, is more about a task. And so uh, for me, I probably naturally sit amongst uh, the people, um, but then there's, uh, then there's what they call a movement, so depending on your role or your job or what you're sort of doing, it, it could be one way or another um, with the different things. And I, just reflecting on that briefly, so I definitely, um, and then to go along with this, and a bunch of those surveys and things that I've done, is that I'm pretty wired by both things. Um, and as I get older, I feel like I become more task. Um, but even in the roles that I have or the ones that you have, like I know for me, probably coming to living grace, I think probably my role is a little bit more task in the, this particular season and where the Lord's leading. So it's a really interesting question. And um, you can look at psychology and all that sort of stuff, but we're going to look at the Bible and see what it says about, um, because both have their value, um, yeah, task and people-focused people. So if you're a task-focused person, um, I'm pretty sure you can relate to this. It can be really annoying when someone is not as productive. Uh, And the flip side is when a people-focused person gets annoyed when the person doesn't actually seem interested in building relationships or listening. We can get annoyed and lose perspective, and it is definitely a challenge for us all. So for those um, who have heard me uh, share a couple of times, so I've done a couple of messages um, in my time at Living Grace, and the first one was about discerning God's call uh, to hear, and, uh, and last time we looked at what it means to step out of the boat and looking at the account of Peter and Jesus walking on water. So for this uh, particular message, as I was preparing, I was uh, specifically looking at Ephesians 3, I thought that was sort of laid on my heart, uh, but then... The Lord uh, laid something on my heart uh, just after the church picnic at the Vonhoffs, which was amazing, by the way, wherever they are. That was fantastic. It was this notion of being task-focused versus people-focused, which I can imagine being a wrestle for all of us. So that particular afternoon, I was running around making sure photos are taken, people were safe, young people were engaged, um, particularly my three-year-old, wasn't in some distant paddock somewhere. (laughs) And they are all good things. They're all good things. But upon reflection, I reflected, what am I doing? In addition to my wife's helpful feedback as we drove home, (laughs) it actually was, I didn't take it well, but I instantly remembered the account of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. Namely, what is good versus what is best. So anyway, I'm a bit of a planner and adapt from plan, but my script was flipped, and today we're going to examine the account of Mary and Martha to see what God has to say to us all. So I asked myself a few questions. Is it better to be people or task-focused person? Should we be a Mary or a Martha What is the difference between spending time with Jesus compared to doing things for Jesus? What does it actually mean to sit at Jesus' feet? Because it's a bit of a funny phrase. And then, not just individually, but corporately, what type of church do we want to be now and into the future where the Lord leads us? 
So we're going to look at the passage. So if you want to look it up, I will also have it on the screen. It's Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. And I'll, I'll read it out uh, for us today. Um, interestingly, I um, hands up who watches The Chosen. This is a bit of a side. Yep, lots of people. Okay. So uh, some of you remember this particular scene from The Chosen, which actually, Chosen, which actually brings it to life in many ways. Um, so I encourage you to check uh, that out as well. But let's look at the passage. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what she said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care what my sister, that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. So Jesus goes to, Mary, to, to Martha's house for a dinner in a place called Bethany, a couple of miles from Jerusalem. It's a pretty big deal. So Martha is busy preparing the meal while her sister Mary is just sitting and listening to Jesus. And for many of you, you may know this account very well, but it's always helpful. I want to ask you guys a question. Have you ever listened so intently to someone that you are hanging on their every word, completely transfixed by who they are and what they are saying? So when I think of this, I think of famous speeches uh, that are done by different people. So this is one example. Wayne Bennett, a rugby league coach. Yep, some people don't know him. More of a soccer thing, congregation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So your famous, famous rugby league coach made lots of different things. That, that photo is actually of him smiling, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, and <laughs> kind of true, kind of not. Uh, another one, uh, the Queen. Uh, the Queen uh, made, you know, I know my family always listened to the, um, yeah, the Christmas um, accounts. Um, I have a different one here. So this is actually uh, Malayla, who's a Pakistani education activist. So someone, um, so that was speaking to the UN uh, a famous uh, speech, you know, talking about education for women, um, amongst those sort of things. So that was that was another example of a really significant uh, speech. And there's lots more. And maybe finally, um, we have someone you might listen to intently, and we got the Reverend Dr. Edgar and and Tatiana Meyer. So a range of different, um, yeah, leading world figures. But but the reality is. Uh, if we actually sort of think about this account, this is nothing uh, compared to Jesus. And, and can you imagine the scene? Um, Mary is uh, sitting here, uh, learning from and paying attention to every word of Jesus. She knew that he was an amazing teacher, and they were friends, and so she made the most of the opportunity to soak in every word. Nothing else mattered. Uh, important to know that sitting at the feet, uh, at someone's feet, was the usual posture of a disciple who was being taught. But for a woman to sit at Jesus' feet was definitely fairly countercultural, uh, as we learn in John 4:27, when the disciples are questioning it as uh, Jesus speaks. Jesus speaks to the woman at the well. But both Jesus and Mary went against the grain. Because we know that Jesus so often went against the cultural customs of the times, didn't he? He transcended the social boundaries, particularly with women. And for Mary, it almost seems at that point that nothing else matters, uh, especially the preparations for the meal, as it turns out. So in the midst of such activity, Mary sat, listened and learned from Jesus. She made the best choice. So now let's look at Martha. She also knew Jesus was a big deal and was gaining popularity as a great teacher. So, and it was at her house, so she started making significant preparations to provide adequate hospitality uh, and for the crowd that was coming. We think it was a, a fair amount of people. And so this is perfectly understandable. If you've got people coming here for Christmas or at different occasions, 
If someone's coming to your house, you want to do your best. And so then I was trying to picture, you know, if someone was coming to my house, who is one person they would like to have over for dinner? Father-in-law. Father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> you just click the next slide. There it is, just a bit slower. So this is a famous picture of uh, famous people. Um, and it's, uh, there's all sorts of figures and uh, yeah, different people that you would love to have over for dinner for different reasons uh, for that. So you've got sort of Beethoven to Bill Gates, Elvis, Pelé, and many more. I think we'd go all out if someone really significant was coming to a house. And I say this because there's nothing with... Sorry, nothing wrong with us wanting to host well or Martha wanting to do her best for Jesus. Being hospitable uh, was a sacred duty at that time. Um, we learn in Luke chapter 10, verses 5 to 7, it says, When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves the wages. It was important. Martha was doing a good thing, the expected thing. But there was something better than Martha could be doing. There was something better that Martha was distracted from. And that was what Mary was doing, sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him. It's kind of like organising a wedding and you miss the ceremony because you're too busy organising the reception. It entirely misses the point. And I'm sure you've all felt this tension. You've hosted a dinner um, and maybe you're clearing the table. You sort of want to have a conversation, but you've got stuff to do and you're not really getting any of it at all. Maybe you feel uh, pulled away, busy, overburdened, whatever it is. But Martha's patience was wearing out with her sister. She wasn't just doing all that stuff. There was something else that happened and that's really important. The patience decreases as the pressure increases. I reckon, and the Chosen captures this a little bit, you can imagine the looks and noises getting louder in the kitchen. She didn't approve her, of her sister's actions, and so she complains. Not to Mary, but to Jesus. Halfway through verse 40, look with me on the screen. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Fairly indirect uh, way of communicating that there. (laughs) See, I think uh, Martha's initial intentions were good, but it's actually a really uh, specific and practical example of how things can quickly spiral out of control and lead us down the wrong path. People can relate. (laughs) In a similar way, we also get a sense that Martha's preparations, they may have been over and beyond beyond what was actually necessary. See, Martha's agenda is not lining up with Jesus, but she's actually more interested in Jesus' agenda lining up with hers. And so like so many others in Scripture, Jesus responds as only Jesus does, and Martha doesn't actually get the answer she hopes for. She might have expected Jesus, like, get in there, hook in, you know, let's get it all sorted, let's have a whole buffet, but Jesus is actually like, no. So let's see what Jesus says uh, in this particular account. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Jesus' response to Martha cuts straight to the heart of the issue with both frankness and directness, but also compassion. I'm sure she appreciated the correction. Uh, like, Like I'm sure we all do when we are stressed and someone challenges us on the fly. But although uh, she was in the company of Jesus, Martha's attention was diverted from spending time with Jesus to doing things for Jesus, and she appeared to become resentful. 
Alistair Begg points to the gentleness of Jesus as he corrected Martha for her attitude, not her actions. Remember, he commended the actions. You could nearly uh, imagine him kind of smiling uh, as he is uh, saying what he is saying with complete love, compassion and grace, but with a very clear-cut message as well. I uh, did some further research on the meaning of some of the words in their original language. Uh, funnily enough, uh, this only came out, uh, this was yesterday, so uh, internet wasn't working, so I had to move the modem, and then I, um, there's books in there, and so I had to sort of clean out the cupboards as I was going. And uh, Edgar gave me, yeah, Edgar gave me um, some books uh, a little while ago, and one of them was the like, interlinear Greek and Hebrew Bible. Pretty light reading most of the time. <laughs> But I was like, I wonder what this says. So here we are. So interestingly, oh, that was fine on my PowerPoint anyway. Um, so I'll shift that up. Love when you change from one thing to another. Don't you love how fonts change, all that sort of stuff changes? We'll, we'll be all Apple one day. But uh, if we look at uh, what's there, so diaconia. So actually, the original meaning uh, for that um, was table service and acts of ministry. So good thing. Good thing again for Martha, wasn't it? What she was kind of about. So table service, but actually acts of ministry. So she saw that as an act of ministry to Jesus, which is a really good thing, isn't it? However, as we sort of progress uh, in, in verse 40, uh, B, uh, Ephistomai, as I'm pronouncing things as best as I can, means to stand over. So we actually see uh, that she gets so frustrated with Jesus, she's literally looking down on him and Mary. And so what started off as a noble pursuit actually quickly spirals. Uh, we can uh, lose sight of what, um, thank you so much, um, what we are trying to do, um, and actually we can develop an unjustified sense of our own importance uh, sometimes when this happens. So what was good got twisted a little bit um, as we go. Furthermore, the words to describe Mary's worries in verse 40 uh, was actually meaning to distract. And then in verse 41, we can see that that uh, thorough bio means an uproar. So, you know, what started off pretty well kind of changed. And it's only kind of in the original language you actually get more of a sense of what that is about. Whereas in Mary's case, uh, we have in uh, verse 39 that um, a beautiful long word, reminds me of a town in New Zealand which has the longest, um, longest uh, town name in the world. Uh, but in verse 39 means to sit alongside of. So she was uh, very connected um, with that there. And then the next word, akouo, um, we'll go with that, meaning, uh, I actually even looked how to pronounce it, and it still doesn't help much, but it actually means to listen. So she is uh, sitting alongside, she's listening, and interestingly, it shows an ongoing action of listening. It's not like, you know, we're having a conversation for 30 seconds, I hear your point of view, Oh, yep, sweet. Don't really actually want to hear. Or I just want to say something. She is fully devoted to listening, potentially for quite a long time. And, and for us, as we sort of fast forward thousands of years later, in a culture that wants instant content, live streams and posts, Mary took time to listen, learn and worship. And I think there's definitely a lesson for us all there. So pretty straightforward, isn't it? Um, Mary is really good. Uh, Martha's got a bit of work to do. <laughs> kind of true in this particular account. But as we dig a little bit deeper, we actually look to different scriptures um, where these ladies are mentioned. So Mary, uh, Martha, sorry, gets a bad rap. We skim through the passage and it's, uh, it's fair enough. She's got the wrong priorities. But there's so much more to it. See, I'm not contradicting, contradicting Jesus here. I think Martha got it wrong, you know, maybe not initially, but as the situation progressed. But it doesn't say that Martha, sorry, Mary, I love that, was a better person or a more devoted follower of Jesus. I think there's lots of compassion we should have for her, and there's a lot to learn and like from her. C, 
see, John chapter 11 talks about the raising of Lazarus. And you may be thinking, this is another place where I've heard about Mary and Martha. So Jesus receives word from Lazarus, uh, word that Lazarus is ill to the point of death in John chapter 11. And so instead of going to the aid of his friend, Jesus delays. When he finally arrives, Lazarus has already died. The moment she learns of Jesus' arrival, Martha rushes to him. In the midst of her grief, she makes a remarkable statement of deep faith. And when Jesus questioned her, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So she knows what Jesus is about. So where's Mary in this account? So she's in the house mourning. Understandable. She doesn't actually come to Jesus until he calls for her. And so she doesn't hear Jesus say the famous words in John chapter 11, verse 25 to 26. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Pretty significant thing he was saying. So both uh, women figure significantly in this story as it sort of uh, goes on. So Martha confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, and Mary's tears prompt Jesus to actually raise Lazarus in gratitude. Mary anoints Jesus' feet with perfume at a banquet where Martha served. Here, Judas criticizes her for wasting money, but Jesus actually commends her. So the script is flipped, and they both have value. See, mourning is not a sin. We need to mourn well. That's really important. And neither is housework. Sorry. <laughs> can't, kids, well, there's not, not many kids here can't use that as, a, as an example. And I'm not highlighting these events to turn people against Mary in favour of Martha and vice versa. See, both were devoted followers of Christ. We learn that as we look at the different texts. None of them were perfect. Martha was probably more of a doer. She has a take charge attitude. Uh, She'll do whatever needs to be done. She'll do it well. I appreciate that. She loves to serve others because we actually see the three times that she's in, in the Gospels, she's serving at each time. And she also speaks her mind. Whereas Mary is a woman of few words. She's not a typical leader, more so a devoted follower. She doesn't maybe offer the same kind of service or action that other people do, but she does offer herself, and she's capable of tremendously beautiful acts of worship, as we see. And so we need Mary and Martha, don't we? If there's a death in your family, Mary will sit with you and put her arms around you while you weep. But you still have to eat. See, Martha's maybe the one that brings you food and makes someone sure sure someone waters the plants and maybe even walks the dog. They have their strengths and weaknesses like we all do. Interestingly, this passage in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42 comes straight after the account of the Good Samaritan in verses 25 to 37. And the Good Samaritan, which is probably even more well-known, is all about loving your neighbour and serving them. And so the account of Mary and Martha about sitting at Jesus' feet being the best thing is actually quite a powerful contrast to the Good Samaritan. Ironically, on the same uh, potential stretch of road, the Jericho Road. So for me, this highlights a really interesting tension um, the value of worship and service that Jesus teaches through his servant, Luke. Both have value. So in this particular account, you know, one is uh, yeah, doing, uh, sitting at Jesus' feet and one is not. So what is the difference? Between spending time with Jesus compared to doing things for Jesus. Is there a difference? Are they related, potentially, as we heard in the skit? See, clearly, as if, if I take our focus uh, in a different area for a second, uh, doing things for Jesus is critical. There's countless passages, so many different ones. Uh, one here on the screen, which you would know very well, the Great Commission, uh, says that you, you have a lot of things um, to sort of get on with. You have the mission uh, here 
that you are trusted to on earth. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. First thing. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. We need to crack on and do things. Ephesians chapter 2, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. And finally, another example, James, um, which the young adults would have heard a couple of weeks ago, faith without works is dead. You know, really interesting tension as we look at what it means for doing things for Jesus uh, compared to spending time with Jesus. See, for me, I think it's the order of priorities which is actually the most important. I think sometimes we have the order reversed, don't we? We do a lot of things for God without spending time with him. And particularly, I think that's probably why I've been challenged uh, by and why I'm sharing this message. See, the needs of ministries are great and endless, aren't they? There's so many things to do. But it is possible for a ministry to take us away from the feet of Jesus. If we're doing it in our own strength and not by the power of the Spirit, we're actually naive, but not just naive. We're actually we're missing out on what God has in store for us, aren't we? It's him and him alone that changes hearts and minds through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are just the vessels. We need to be prayerful and discerning about what ministries and tasks we do and don't take on. And that's something that is a real personal wrestle and something I've been... Yeah, really kind of working through in lots of ways. Hence why the sermon got flipped, potentially. See, our value or worth as a person isn't actually reliant on what we do or what we have. It's in who God says we are. We don't have to earn our value or prove our worth to Jesus by doing more things. Jesus doesn't need our good deeds as number one. He wants relationships with us. We live in a culture where everything is conditional, whereas Jesus' love for you is actually not. You can't earn it. He freely gives it. See, spending time at Jesus' feet, actually, it aligns us with his will. And we experienced that uh, just a glimpse this morning. Um, We are filled with the Holy Spirit, and we actually want to serve and share of his goodness. It is the natural response. And it is, not, um, it is not burdensome. It's actually the most liberating thing. The shackles are off. And it's from this position at sitting at Jesus' feet and him directing us that we actually get clarity and wisdom which paths to go down and where God is actually leading us. Maybe what we've seen other churches do or what this is, this is a good strategy and all that sort of stuff. So this phrase, sitting of Jesus' feet, what does, it, what does it actually mean? It's definitely a different one. Um, it's probably not something we do that often. Maybe, um, I think, it, like in pebbles right now, they would probably be sitting because they're little and their body's a lot more nimble. <laughs> but obviously we can't physically sit at the feet of Jesus, can we? 2,000 years later... How can we actually sit and learn from him? And the reality is we're all wired in a different way. Um, you know, some people really uh, work, uh, resonate with uh, music. Other times it might be a prayer or vision or through scriptures. and might be lots of different ways. But there is some pretty clear ways as well that we are taught. So in our busy and modern lives, uh, there's a, I've got a list, um, and it doesn't include everything. And it's not in any particular order. Um, but for me, the, what, it, what I'm actually sort of saying is not rocket science, but actually carrying it out and being consistent with it is the key. This is just a glimpse. Schedule a time to pause and be still with God. 
Some people, they might actually be going for a run in nature. Other people, not at all. Study the Bible. Pretty good way to get to know who Jesus is. Develop a consistent prayer life, personally and in community. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you daily. Listen to uh, worship music, sermons, podcasts regularly. Sometimes, um, you know, for me coming today, um, driving, it was more music and worship music, whereas other times it might be more podcasts and actually it's kind of like work. You're thinking through stuff. So it, it can vary for different purposes. Invest in Christ-focused friendships. People will build you up, not bring you down. and Make sure you build them up, not bring them down. And attend church weekly. Surround yourself and your family with like-minded believers. Regularly. In a time where average uh, you know, attendance and anything we do in commitment is a month, monthly thing. We've moved from weekly to monthly. The Bible says no. And I acknowledge uh, there's different seasons and commitments in life. Uh, I have young, ki- young kids, so I'm kind of speaking uh, to myself probably more than anyone else uh, in the room. But the reality is we all have the same time. Well, it doesn't matter who you are, does it? But it is how you prioritise it. It's like that jar, you know, do you put the big rock in first or is just maybe God just gets a little bit of sand? We can fill our lives with extracurricular activities, entertainment, sport, exercise, uh, music, socialising, you know, there's a million different things. And not for a moment am I saying they're bad. But we need to be intentional about how we are using our time. Because God so often gets the leftovers, doesn't he? Whether or not that's actually time, relationships, finances, whatever it is. So often we want God to fall in line with our plans rather than actually falling in line with his and being shaped by them. So are we willing to prioritise Jesus in our lives so we actually can learn from him and be transformed by his teaching? It's a hard truth. See, for me, one, um, you know, I'm certainly growing in this area, as we all are, but one thing I've really uh, learnt and probably valued at, at Living Grace is the importance of sitting at Jesus' feet. Having specific time to stop. Sometimes it means you're, you're hooking and get some of that stuff uh, done so then you can stop. To listen, pray, learn and spend with him. Uh, we had, like, the Sunday morning prayer, which we had, was yeah, quite a significant time from 8 to 9. Encounter prayer on Tuesday afternoons from 5.30 to 6.30. Uh, personally, it's been great to have sort of times where you, just, you know that you're sitting at Jesus' feet. And you kind of actually schedule and plan those things in. See, everything we do comes out of our relationship with Jesus. And so it should be for our church, our living grace. Are we in a Mary or a Martha season as a church? We talk about seasons. I would say, I would say both. I, I think we're in a really interesting season as to where God leads it. I feel like every week it's getting more interesting. But one thing that I've been really challenged on when looking to the future of Living Grace is, you know, what is, what is the shape of ministry? What are the programs? What are the ministries? Uh, and for those who sort of um, been on the journey with strategy and vision, there's so many good things. But what is best? God is the one who guides us and we need to be adaptable to his leading. We need to ensure we have spaces for authentic experiences to sit at Jesus' feet like the different prayer meetings, encounter evenings, spaces for people of all ages to grow in relationship, you know, right through toddlers, living stones, youth, young adults, and and, and regular prayer and small groups. We also need ways to be Jesus' hands and feet, like soul, food food pantry, pastoral care, and some of the community outreaches that we're doing uh, with Carnival of Flowers and the movie. So we need to leave spaces for the Spirit to move, Because when we do, he shows up time after time. But on the other side, we need to work towards that as a church. And if I just even think of today, you know, are we thankful for those who who serve, potentially on Sundays and other days, which enables you to sit at Jesus' feet and experience the power 
of God through our services as we have this morning. Roles maybe such as uh, the welcoming uh, team there, check-in, reception, cleaning, a beautiful clean building. Thank you, Jennifer. Communion, prayer, children and youth ministry. There's, there's so many roles uh, that happen. See, we all have our part to play in the building up of God's church, don't we? We may not have Jesus at our table physically, but he is always with us, teaching and guiding us. It is only Jesus that holds the universe together by the word of his power. He dwells in us by his spirit, as it says in 1 John 3, and strengthens us for the tasks ahead. Individually and as a church, we need to continue to sit at Jesus' feet. Listen to Jesus, and then he will continue to direct our steps. We're not all the same. We don't have to be uniform. But what we do know, what we do need is we need to be unified by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can be completely different, but we need to be not uniform, but unified. See, it's only through that that a great move of God can take place. Bringing home the prodigal, saving the lost, and impacting the fabric of our communities. Not just in our lifetime, but for generations to come. See, God wants us to be like Martha and Mary in different ways at different times, as both believed in Jesus in Jesus as the Messiah. But you know what? Most importantly, he wants us to be with Jesus and be like Jesus. We need to be people and task-focused people. But more importantly, we need to be Jesus-focused people. We need to listen and learn from Jesus. We need to serve Jesus through our words and actions. We need to be mindful of all that might pull us away from both of these tasks. We need to spend time sitting at the feet of Jesus and encountering our most awesome and living God. So that we can be sent out into the world to serve him. So let's pray as we ask for the Lord's help. With that. I'll make David's prayer for us all in Psalm 86 verse 11. Lord, give us all in an undivided heart that we may live in awe of your name. Jesus, you are the one thing worth being concerned about. You are the one thing that will never be taken from us. Being with you must always take precedent over doing for you. Help us to follow this today and always. Lord, thank you for the privilege it is to sit at your feet and be in your presence, to learn from you and know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, we're going to uh, continue uh, sitting at Jesus' feet, and we're actually going to have an opportunity um, shortly um, as so Mark and, and some of the music team will, will play along. And I really want to encourage everyone, wherever you're at, to, to stop and think what it is to sit at Jesus' feet. So for some of you in this sort of open ministry time spa- space, uh, this may involve coming up the front, you know, the foot of the cross, or just being uh, here in this open area. And there'll be uh, opportunity to people, uh, people to pray for you. Uh, for others, um, you might just want to sit in your seat, close your eyes, reflect on the priorities and seasons of your life. Um, but w- whatever it is, wherever you're at, uh, I want to encourage you to pause and let God speak to you. Maybe it's a time of coming back to the Lord. Maybe you know, the idea of sitting at Jesus' feet is a completely a new and different thing. Maybe you don't even know too much about Jesus at all. Let's have a time to stop, pause, sit at Jesus' feet and just allow the Spirit to move.
So we'll do that as, uh, as Mark begins to play. Um, and if, if some people do want to head off uh, as well, you can do that um, if you need to go and mentally prepare yourself for the soccer game. <laughs> so the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>